Welcome, yeah. Operator. Huh. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I'll just put on my speaker phone uh, because yeah. my sound is bad. Yeah, so we can hear clear. Huh. So, Deepankar, uh, you please look after the people. I'll do the introduction meanwhile. And sure. Yeah, so give me one second. And Hi, Hi. Uh, <laughs> I can see more? a lot of familiar names. How are you? Are you in Delhi? Yeah, yeah. Few more letters to be signed. <laughs> yeah. So, excellent. Thank God we have now managed to get over the glitch. And, yeah. Speaker, you Speaker, Always, that's always the case. <laughs> So let me let me yeah. introduce Operita to uh, everyone. Uh, I personally know Operita from probably 1991, uh, but then of course we lost contact because she was in the field and those were the days of non-communication. And we got mm -hmm. back into communication after probably a decade. And um, uh, we used to get feedbacks about her when she was in Namdafa. And I started going to Namdafa and heard about her findings of Obviously, not only the hornbills of the of the deer, the leaf deer, and the different uh, things over there, and uh, she she now leads the NCF's Eastern Himalaya program, under which research and community-based conservation with hornbills as a flagship species has been carried out for over 20 years. Uh, she completed her PhD on hornbill biology and their role in seed dispersal in year 2000. Uh, some of our other work has involved understanding hunting and logging impacts, biological exploration in Arunachal Pradesh, and new mammal species discoveries, uh, seed dispersal, seed predation, uh, establishing community-based conservation, intervention with the tribal communities, uh, nature education, forest restoration, establishing hornbill nest adoption program in Arunachal. Uh, she has written several books uh, for children, she has been a member of the National Tiger Conservation Authority and State Wildlife Advisory Board of Arunachal. She has engaged with government on the management of several tiger reserves and critiqued proposed uh, hydropower projects in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. She now believes that doing research is more satisfying uh, than easy uh, and easy than the an on ground conservation and the reconciliation between wildlife and people is not always possible. Uh, she has received several awards over the years, including National Geographic Emerging Explorer Award in 2010, Whitley Fund for Nature Award 2013, and she is also currently the co-chair Asia for IUCN Hornbill Specialist Group. And I will hand over to you. Meanwhile, uh, I'll just uh, shoot on. Thanks. Yes. I'll just share the screen. Yes. Yeah? Yes. First, yes. let's see if that is working. Huh? You can that's do that. what I'm worried about. Um, Wait, first I'll have to... Because I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to share yeah, your screen. Yeah, just one minute. And also a request to all the participants that uh, while you are here, you can turn off your microphone so that there is no background noise coming in. Um, and while she speaks, you can send all your questions in the chat box. At the end of the program, I'll, uh, I'll read out the questions and the, and the queries can be answered. Excellent. Great. Can you uh, see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Th thank you very much for inviting me. And although it's a very uh, bad time to start and give a talk, uh, eight o'clock in the night, but thank you. And uh, I hope all of you uh, will, you know, have the patience to listen. Um, it is a bit long because um, yeah, so um, my, uh, I'll be, so before I, you know, so Sujan basically asked me to talk about 
our work in North Bengal, which has just start, you know, started three years ago. Uh, so most of my work has, of course, been in Arunachal and some other states in Northeast India. So, you know, there's been 20 years of research in other parts of, um, in, in Arunachal and all that. And, uh, minute, how this, why isn't this going? Um, the next slide is not coming. What would happen? Use the lower left hand corner oh, arrow. Yeah, but it's. Um, Are you doing it through the Zoom uh, app or you're doing it through your actual presentation? I was doing it through the my uh, computer. It works normally that way, no? So why isn't it Bottom working? Bottom left, there's an, uh, there's an arrow. Mm -hmm. of the, on the screen? On the screen. See where the Nature Conservation Foundation logo is, just below that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you just can click on those arrows. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, before I go on to that, I just wanted to talk about hornbills. So hornbills are, this is of course not an Indian species of hornbill. It's the wrinkled hornbill found in uh, Southeast Asia. And it's a very, um, you know, so hornbills are very bizarre looking. They are like, you know, um, they have these, many of them have these huge casks. They have this um, orbital skin around their eyes. And although mostly they are black and white or brown in color in terms of their plumage, they have uh, a lot of startling and striking colors in their, you know, in their cask or in their uh, orbital skin, or they have these gula pouches in which they carry, they can carry up to 200 fruits. Um, so they're very large and striking birds in the forest. And, you know, my prior work has always, you, you know, was always on mammals. And I was not much of a bird watcher before when I first started work in the forests in Arunachal. I used to study squirrels and other species. And, uh, but hornbills were very prominent in the place in pa uh, Arunachal where I began my uh, main work uh, in Pake Tiger Reserve. And you know, somehow I fell in love with them. And also because I was interested in their role as seed dispersers. Um, they're you know, very, very highly frugivorous and important seed dispersers. So, so that, you know, that resulted in my, you know, uh, you know, beginning my work on hornbills and, um, oops, what happened? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next, you know, so the, uh, there are, uh, as all of you, many of you would be knowing there are nine species of hornbills in India and in, uh, in the North Bengal region, you actually have five species, but the Indian gray hornbill is not seen more in the forested areas, but it's seen in, you know, slightly, you know, rural areas and near towns maybe. So the, the main species in the, in the North Bengal area is the great hornbill, the rufous necked hornbill, the wreathed, and the oriental pied hornbill. And, uh, and in Northeast India also, you have five species, which includes the uh, brown hornbill, but not the Indian gray. So, you know, our main work has been in the Eastern Himalaya biodiversity hotspot, which is at the confluence of three different realms, uh, the Palearctic, the Indian, and the Indo-Malayan. And in that region, Arunachal has been the main you know, place where I've worked. It has very low human population density and, you know, arguably the most, the highest uh, forest cover. And it had remained poorly explored for a very long time. Uh, but fortunately, in the last 20 years, there's been much work and many new discoveries happening in the state um, of, you know, uh, a whole range of uh, flora and fauna. And our uh, 20 years of work on hornbills has covered many aspects of their biology, including feeding and breeding, um, nesting uh, habitat and looking at their abundances in different areas and the kind of impacts they face due to logging and hunting. And a large part of our work uh, has also focused on, on their role in seed dispersal with one of my PhD students, actually my first PhD student, Rohit Nani Wadekar. A lot of uh, you know, the work has been with Rohit. We've also looked at the impact of uh, hornbill loss on forest regeneration. Uh, in places where hornbills have declined due to hunting and logging. We've also uh, assessed the distribution and conservation status of hornbills in uh, 
Arunachal and some of the other northeastern states. We also began, uh, started some conservation initiatives with local communities through the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program and other uh, related initiatives. So, um, you know, the great hornbill is the largest among the species and it weighs about three to four kilos. And, uh, you know, it is, it is also uh, you know, the most vulnerable in Northeast India in terms of, you know, people uh, seeking its cask and its feathers. It is uh, a little bit more territorial than the wreathed, uh, some of the other species and you know, as our studies have shown that it has really small home ranges um, during the breeding season up to only one to two square kilometers. But it, in the non-breeding season, it can move, you know, much higher, much more, 50 to 60 square kilometers. And it is more of a fig eater and it is quite a predator during the breeding season. It feeds quite a bit on animal matter in the breeding season compared to the others. And recently, in the last uh, IUCN update, it was, um, you know, its status was uh, uplisted to vulnerable because of, you know, it's, um, you know, globally, uh, you know, it's in decline in many places. Um, then we have the reef thornbill, which is a very interesting species because it has, you know, it, it forms these large flocks when it's communally roosting. It has, um, even though its body size is smaller than the great hornbill, 2.5 kilos, it you know, has really large home ranges, even during the breeding season. Um, it seems to have a very different foraging strategy from the great hornbill. It feeds a lot more on non-fig fruits, uh, a variety of you know, um, tree species in the forest. Um, yeah, and... Uh, the, uh, the status of the wreathed hornbill is also vulnerable. The oriental pied hornbill, as many of you would know, is a much more common species. It's, um, it's you know, very adaptable. It's found in secondary forest and even in, you know, rural areas, near, uh, seen near towns and, you know, uh, many, many sometimes in cities. Um, so, and it's a much smaller size species, 800 to 900 grams. The rufous neck hornbill is, to my mind, the most beautiful among the hornbills found in, um, in India, and its status is vulnerable. It is found in slightly higher elevations compared to the rest of the um, other species. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the higher areas in Arunachal, it is actually um, pretty, um, you know, targeted uh, by hunters um, because it is... Um, you know, in those areas, you don't get the great hornbill much. Um, and it's, it, it is much less studied and less well known. Even from my PhD study, uh, we did not study the species because in Pake, we worked in the lower elevation forest where the rufous neck doesn't occur. The other uh, interesting species in Northeast India is the brown hornbill, which we've started studying since the last three years in Upper Assam, in Dihing Patkai and Joypur Reserve Forest with the student Bhaskar. Um, and the status, of, and this is a very interesting species. It's a cooperative green uh, hornbill. So, you know, our main work has been in the Pakhe Tiger Reserve, uh, which has four sympatric hornbill species, and also in the Namda Tiger Reserve, which is uh, which has five uh, sympatric hornbill species. Um, so that's been our, you know, 20 years of work in many of these areas, and this is our, my, uh, you know, the, some of the team that currently works um, in some of the different projects that we have. I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge them and mention them in the beginning of my talk. And these are a lot of, uh, these are our staff from Pake and Assam, um, who all do different things. Some of them are involved in the restoration project. Some of them are in the other field uh, research project uh, team. And they're all from the local community. Uh, community is there. Um, so coming to North Bengal. So, you know, very excited to have begun work in North Bengal because many years ago before I began, you know, as an MSc student and I started my um, work in Arunachal, I had always wanted to work in Nyora Valley National Park. Um, and in fact, some one of my first research proposals after my MSc was to go and work there. 
but somehow it got changed to Arunachal. And then I never went back to uh, North Bengal. And an opportunity came because, you know, there was this, um, Arjun Basu Roy was in touch with me. He had come to Pake and they were very keen to start a project on hornbills. And uh, I was just giving them some advice on some proposal and that didn't come through. But then I had a grant to uh, expand and do our work in some new areas. And with that, uh, we began a collaboration and we signed, you know, we did, had an MOU and it has been very, very uh, fruitful. And we've le learned much uh, from our work in, um, you know, in North Bengal, though it's only been three years. So this is the team in Baksa. Um, so Orko was the person who worked in the first two years. He left the project in June 2018. And then uh, Karishma joined as an intern, Karishma Pradhan, and she is now with the team. And Dollar joined last year in September 2018. And then there is Sitaram, who's been a mainstay of the program from the beginning. He has, he's, uh, you know, he's part of Nature Mates and he worked with them before. He is from that area. He, um, he's from the village there. And uh, he's amazing in his natural history skills and his interest in plants. And then there is uh, Kejang or Kezacho Tukpa. He's from one of the, uh, he's from that uh, village, um, I'm forgetting the name, yeah, it's uh, up in the, in the hilly uh, part. Then there was Kishan, Kishan Das, who also has helped the team during some of the, you know, field data collection. Um, yeah, so right now, you know, it's mainly, um, Karishma, Sitaram, and Dollar, who've been doing a lot of the field work. I unfortunately haven't been there actually since September, and I'm really missing uh, being in the field. Um, so it, when we began it, it uh, you know, wanted to say that it was seen as, I mean, uh, it has re resulted in quite a bit of information, and it is uh, one of the first detailed studies on hornbills in the North Bengal landscape. North Bengal also forms the westernmost distribution limit for the wreathed hornbill and the rufous neck hornbill. And uh, this is stuff that I've already said, right? So one of the main objectives was to look at, uh, understand their breeding biology in the area, the nest site and nesting habitat characteristics and their diet, and look at nesting success, threats, and other requirements for hornbills in the landscape. So I must say that, you know, when we began this project, it was not going to be so much research. It was originally, um, you know, it's part of uh, uh, my idea to expand the idea of the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program to other landscapes. So the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program uh, is in Arunachal, right? It's outside a protected area. But we uh, wanted to identify critical Hornbill areas in other states where we could uh, start similar programs in terms of long-term monitoring and protection of hornbill nests and all that. But then we realized that we couldn't begin in a vacuum. We needed to first understand a lot of things uh, and do some research also in the landscape before, you know, um, uh, jumping into some conservation work. And uh, even though we know a lot about the breeding biology and nest site characteristics, you know, every area there'll be some differences, right? So we want, we needed to understand that. So yeah, this is Baksa, the hilly part of Baksa, um, you know, uh, slightly beyond the Jayanti River. Actually, this is on the Bhutan side, actually. So yeah. So in the last two years or three years, we've um, found, we began work in November, 2017. Um, so we have uh, about three seasons of uh, breeding season data. The breeding season is ongoing right now. Hornbills are in, inside the nest. And uh, so we have, you know, in the first year we had, as you can see in the table, you can, uh, you know, there were these many nests that were found uh, of the four species. And then we had uh, in 2019, fortunately we found a lot more um, rufous neck hornbill nests, and uh, then um, and it also shows the number of active nests. One of the great hornbill nests uh, trees uh, was lost in a storm, 
uh, at the end of the breeding period uh, in the end of i mean uh, towards the end of 2018 uh, these are the locations of uh, most of the nestries uh, in in the waxa tiger reserve and oops wait ah just a minute yeah. Just a quick update for you. Uh, your Baksa uh, Tiger Reserve director is here in the meeting. So okay, yeah, yeah, I saw him. Yes. I saw him. You be careful yeah. what you say. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we had. Um, so I wanted to say in Baksa, the uh, you know the main nestry species is on Tetramelis snudiflora, which is. Uh, you know, which is a very important nest tree, even in Pake Tiger Reserve. But in Pake, it, it is actually 90% of the nest trees are on tetramelis. But here in Baksa, there seems to be other species that are used, like Terminaria bellerica, Shima wallachi, and all those. Yeah. So, uh, but still, it is very important for all four species, the uh, tetramelis nudiflora. And, oops, why am I doing this? What happened? Why did it go away? Um, one minute, yeah, just a minute, I don't know why this happened, um, are you guys, okay, sorry, the screen sharing went off for some time, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, I pressed some other key, it's very confusing. Why is this happening? Yeah. Um, so uh, these are some of the nestry, uh, you know, nestries and what they look like. So um, you know, hornbills uh, do not, you know, contrary to what many people might think, hornbills actually nest in. You know, try to nest in as small a cavity as possible in terms of, you know, squeezing the, the, you know, the female really squeezes in because they have to seal the cavity with their feces. The large hornbills seal the cavity with their own droppings. Um, only in the smaller hornbills will you see the, uh, the male bringing mud for the female to seal, like in the oriental white hornbill. So, you know, in the bottom... Uh, right hand corner you see one uh, the nest tree of a rufous neck hornbill which is at a really low elevation and it is uh, a very strange nest where you know the cavity is not visible and it's you know very much inside and it's kind of overgrown with climbers and stuff so it's very hard to see whether it's uh, sealed uh, this was actually one of the lowest elevation nest trees that one has ever found of rufous neck hornbill so these are the nestry characteristics of some of these species and you can see that the you know great hornbill is you know in a lower elevation so is the oriental pied whereas the rufous necked hornbill is found in higher elevations uh, except for one of the nests which is in the lower elevation and you know these are the nestry parameters just you know about the the height of the nestry and the nest cavity height the height of the branch and the girth of the trees um, and 89 percent of the cavities are on the main trunk which is kind of unusual because in Aru arunachal we find a lot of the cavities are also on the primary branches or secondary branches um, also uh, you know we see a differentiation between the hornbill species in terms of the cavity shape usually because the great hornbill usually nests in elongated cavities whereas the um, Wreathed hornbill often has, you know, wreathed hornbill is more, uh, I mean, whatever, it's not so clear, but it's also oval, whereas the oriental pied hornbill nests usually in more round cavities. And that's because, you know, these cavities are usually on these emergent trees, which are often prone to branch breakage due to storms. Also, a lot of bird activity happens because of woodpeckers and others, you know, whole nesting birds, which which make these cavities for, uh, you know, oriental pied hornbills to use. And oriental pied hornbills are actually quite, uh, have to compete with a lot of other hole nesting birds like great steady woodpecker and um, broad-billed roller and uh, red-breasted parakeet in Arunachal. Uh, we haven't yet seen all that competition so much over here, 
because it's just the beginning, uh, I mean, in terms of some of the data. This is just other characteristics of the nest trees in terms of where they are located in terms of the canopy. And uh, many of the cavities were uh, oriented to in, the, in a southerly, uh, south, southerly direction. Um, so um, our team, uh, basically Orko and Karishma and Sitaram, as well as some of the others and in the different years, they first one of the things that we started doing was looking at you know, uh, doing intensive nest watches at some of the nest, selected nests after the female entry. So I won't go much into the methodology, but basically in 2018 and 2019, we had these many hours of observation at two great hornbill nests and two rufous necked hornbill nests. And um, this is a sequence that just shows about the breeding biology of the hornbill. These pictures, by the way, are not taken by me. They're all by Karishma or by Sitaram or by Orko. Um, these, uh, so that's the pair before the female has entered. And this is the second picture shows the ceiling and the male delivering. Um, you know, in fact, these guys recorded a lot of lizards, uh, different reptiles being fed at the nests over here. And that, that uh, picture on the left bottom is the female emerging. So in the great hornbills, as many of you will know, um, the nesting season starts from March. In Baksa, it starts a bit earlier than in Baki, in the towards the end of February, beginning of March. And uh, nesting is over by July. But the female comes out in the middle of the breeding season, around June usually. And she helps the male in feeding for the last one month before the uh, uh, chick comes out. So the chick reseals the cavity after the female uh, goes out. So the last picture shows the chick. And this is the visitation rate of the hornbill, uh, the male hornbill to the nests. Uh, this is based on data collected for four nests in both the years combined. And it basically shows that the, after the hatching, so the hornbills, are, uh, you know, the chick usually hatches around the seventh week. And this is known from data from captive uh, hornbills in zoos because in the wild it's very hard to really make out when the chick has exactly hatched. We can make out sometimes from chick vocalizations but uh, you know the exact uh, date of chick hatching is, is difficult to make out uh, you know, from below the nest. And uh, so as you can see during uh, after the chick hatches the delivery uh, the visitation by the male uh, you know was higher. This graph shows the food delivery rates. That is the number of food items delivered per hour. And again, that also shows an increase in the post hatching phase as you would expect. Um, okay, so this crazy graph shows you basically the co contribution of figs, non-fig species and animal matter in the hornbill's diet, in the great hornbill diet. So you can see that figs are very important, especially during the time of uh, before and during um, um, after chick hat, I mean, just before, you know, after chick hatching. And animal matter, as you can see, increases after the chick hatches, uh, you know, which helps the chick's uh, development. So in, in Baksa, the breeding season diet, we found 89% is fruits and 11% is animal matter, which is more or less similar to what we found in Pake, which is around 90, you know, 95%. Um, figs um, were, you know, 42% of the diet was figs and the, you know, the remaining was for, you know, um, non-figs. A lot of important uh, plant species in the diet, which have also been recorded in Parquet Tiger Reserve and animal matter included all these other things, right? So, yeah. So this is my favorite um, <laughs> slide, which I just prepared today from pictures that um, Sita Ram has taken and others, also maybe some by Karishma and others, but it's basically showing a lot of the exciting fruit species that you find in uh, Baksa. So these, you know, many of these are, um, so Hornbill, you know, uh, the family Miliaceae, Miristicaceae and uh, Lauraceae, members of, you know, a species in these families are very important in the Hornbill's diet. And also some of the other, um, you know, like this is canarium, that green uh, fruits you see on top. 
Then many of the other dehiscent fruits that you see are, um, are these agleas and chysoketone and uh, some of them are the Lauraceae members, the, blue, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the blackish colored droops, um, actinodaphne. Then there is polyalkia, which is this uh, on the left hand bottom. It's not, a, it's not a picture of a ripe fruit, it's a semi ripe fruit. Then Lyxia, and then Ficus, of course. Um, so there's a variety of uh, food species in the diet. Oh my God, sorry, again I did this. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the, this is a picture just of, uh, you know, the rufous neck hornbill foraging on a species called Litsia panamanja. Um, this is again Sita Ram's picture. And uh, it's very exciting for me because some of these species also occur in Pake. Although the vegetation is uh, quite different in some ways. So just going back to some of our work in Pake, basically I wanted to say that even in Baksa, although um, we've not, we don't know about many of the other tree species in Baksa, but it will be very similar because it's also a tropical uh, semi-evergreen and you know, uh, forest. Um, the, in Pake, 78% of the tree species were animal dispersed. And 26% of tree species were consumed by hornbills. Actually there's more, but you know, I only recorded 90 uh, in the diet, 90 species in the first few years when we worked there. Um, so the hornbill menu, uh, this is just like a picture showing all the kinds of different seeds that they disperse. And this is from under a roost tree. And also you can see the legs of, uh, you know, beetles and then there's crabs. And so even in Baksa, many of the same species are eaten. Okay. So now, uh, just coming to the outcome of the, uh, you know, nesting uh, in the four great hornbill nests that we had monitored in, uh, intensively in 2018 and 19. So the nesting duration ranged from 114 to 117 days. And uh, one nest was not successful. Oh, sorry. All the nests were successful in the great hornbill. In one case, we didn't know the uh, entry date, so we couldn't calculate the entire nesting duration. But basically, you can see that the chick uh, nesting is much earlier here uh, compared to Pake. Huh? It's in the first week of uh, March or you know last week of February, and uh, chicks emerge by the end of June. And uh, the interestingly, the nesting duration is also shorter in Baksa. Uh, compared to Pake. Pake, the nesting duration of Great Hornbill, the mean nest is about, you know, 120 to 130 days. Um, yeah, so this is showing the chick coming out of the nest and the chick and, you know, the, after the chicks come out of the nest, the, you know, you can see the female is feeding the chick. These are photos by Karishma, very nice photos. Um, then we also looked at the breeding biology of rufous neck hornbill, and I just wanted to say that we did not have any uh, un really uh, proper understanding of the breeding biology of rufous neck hornbill before we worked in Baksa. And that's really nice because in Arunachal, the problem is that we knew a few nests in Namdafa, we knew a few nests in Eagle Nest, but because of the terrain uh, in many of these, uh, in those areas, even though we've worked on hornbills for such a long time there, rufous neck hornbill was very elusive and uh, the nests could not be followed uh, through the breeding season because in Arunachal, they start nesting in the end of April and they go on till August, which is the peak monsoon. And, you know, some of those nests in the hilly terrain and with the rivers and the streams, totally inaccessible. So we really didn't know, you know, uh, a lot of the details of the biology. So in Baksa, fortunately in the first year, Orko and Sitaram found a nest at a very low elevation, which was accessible. So anyway, so this is basically showing the visitation at uh, three nests uh, in, the, in the breeding season. And again, you know, uh, I mean, there's no clear pattern here, really. 
But basically, at the outcome at four, four of these uh, nests, uh, okay, so one nest was not watched intensively, but I've added it here because we could get the entry and the exit date for this nest. And it's pretty short, you know. Uh, this nest uh, was in, you know, upstream of the Jayanti River in the Dinku Nala. And again, you know, Sitaram and Kejang really made a very, very difficult effort to reach these nests uh, towards the end of the season to get the exit date to see the chick because um, it was quite flooded, you know, the Nala. And I had gone there in May and that time itself it was quite difficult. But, uh, you know, they went there and so in the, in, you know, in the, the low elevation nest that they found in the first year. It's interesting if you see that the date of entry uh, in both years at this nest was exactly the same. And it was much earlier than the nesting in the other nests. And in general, in Arunachal, we knew that the nesting of Rufus Nect is from the last week of April. I mean, uh, third week of April to fourth week of April. So, you know, I think in the higher elevations, they stick to that. But this nest is unusual, the one which was at the low elevation. But it was not successful in 2019. And, uh, wait. I keep doing this, yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. So this is a picture of the chick, which was again taken by Sitaram. Great difficulty during the rains. It was raining heavily during that time. Again, it was in August. And this this is a video which I'll just play for you to show you how crazy the weather was then and it was raining and windy and the chick was refusing to come out. This is near the border with Bhutan, huh? a very uh, upstream of... Uh... Okay. Just, I'm playing it forward just to, it's long. So actually it didn't, I think it refused to come out. This is another nest which was found by Kejang in the higher elevations. And you know, it was at a very low height, about six meters. And unfortunately later in the season, this nest was unsuccessful. Um, they found that, you know, it had been, uh, the seal had been broken and the male, uh, the female was missing and all that and the male did not come later. So we don't know what exactly happened. We uh, are not sure if it was poached or it was predated. So this is a video of the, uh, and this Kejang has managed to take with his phone and binoculars, by the way, he's used his. So, okay. Yeah. So when you observe hornbills at, you know, when you do nest watches from a suitable distance, you can actually count the number of fruits being delivered and even identify many, very often the species that are being delivered. And that's the way we are able to uh, determine the diet of these birds. Oh God, I keep pressing the wrong thing, okay. So um, one of the, that nest which I was talking about, which was in the lower altitude of Rufus Nect, um, usually the nests are higher, right? And the great hornbills nests are usually in the lower elevation range. In 2019, the field team saw that the great hornbill pair, one great hornbill pair started disturbing the breeding uh, Rufus Nect pair. And uh, later, the, you know, the nest was not successful. So the GH pair, the great hornbill pair still came to the tree. And uh, I believe this year it's not active. I mean, it was active. It was uh, uh, initiated nesting, but again, it has not uh, been, uh, I think it's been abandoned, the nesting at this nest. Um, okay, so outcome at all nests. I just wanted to, I mean, uh, look at the, you know, you can look at the numbers, but basically, in 2018, seven out of the 10 nests were successful with chick fledging and uh, three were unsuccessful. One was lost in a storm, the tree itself fell. 
And in the Oriental Pied Hornbill, actually, um, you know, um, two of the chicks were poached. And this is something that we've actually discussed with the department and informed the department. So it is some uh, one issue that is over there. And it was quite surprising to us that, you know, there seems to be some, it may be for the pet, uh, you know, uh, they seem to be taking the chicks uh, at a young, uh, you know, at, at the time in June or sometime, right, where before they come out. Um, so in 2019, also the same, uh, uh, the nesting success was a bit low. Um, like I said, one rufous necked hornbill, I don't know what happened. We're not sure if it was a natural predation or the uh, nest was poached. In another nest, we could not make out the uh, ultimate outcome because it, you know, it was not accessible. Okay, so one of the things, you know, this is just to show that, what, you know, there's something strange happened in a wreathed hornbill nest. So towards the end of the breeding season, when they were monitoring the nest, um, uh, the staff noticed that the, in the wreath tonbill nest, the female was hanging out of the cavity. It seemed like her foot was stuck. So then uh, they informed the forest department and some of the forest department staff and you know, our staff, they went together. And one guy, I think, was able to climb the, the tree and get down the bird and figure out, like, I mean, you know, it was attacked by ants. It was dead by the time they managed to get it. Uh, I think its foot had got caught, you know, in the cavity or something and it got stuck. So the male was seen hanging around. So this is the female. You can see that the female is a different color, right? So female's all black and it has a blue gula pouch. So um, the chick, uh, the person who climbed could not make out if there was a chick inside. I mean, if, it didn't look like there was anybody you know, inside. And uh, one of the images I've shown you of the tree trunk, it's of the oriental pied hornbill nest, which we believe was poached. Um, there were some marks on the tree, which indicates that people, you know, uh, put nails and climb it. Um, so these are some of the issues that we discovered, um, you know, due to our work. So I just wanted to compare the nesting success in Baksa versus what we've seen in Arunachal. In Arunachal, we have data for 22 years, but I'm not showing the data for 22 years, but I'm just showing the data for the last eight, nine years um, to show the nesting success in the reserve forest, Papum Reserve Forest, where we have the nest adoption program with the nest protectors. 80% nesting success there and 90% inside the tiger reserve in Pake. Right, so, but in Baksa, the nesting success was a bit lower. And of course, it's, it's, it's only for the last two years, right? So it's not, it may be, you know, just a couple of uh, things that happened uh, and uh, it may be, uh, and the sample size is much lower, of course. But I just, uh, you know, thought I would uh, um, mention that. The other objective that we had with our work in Baksa was to also estimate the abundance, the densities of these uh, four sympatric species. And uh, in the first year, Orko, uh, with an effort of 133 kilometers, he walked six trails, mainly in the core area, in the good forest. Um, uh, and he got enough sightings and, you know, the densities of Great Hornville were quite high, about 10 birds per square kilometer. Uh, wreathed hornbill, as expected, was a bit lower, and uh, oriental pied hornbill was, you know, around three, uh, yeah, three to four birds per square kilometer. Um, subsequently, uh, you know, this year um, we decided that we needed to understand better the hornbill distribution and occupancy and their abundance across the landscape. So we had this grid-based design, uh, 25 square kilometer grids for the entire area. And the idea was to walk 1.5 kilometer, three trails in each grid. And along with that measure vegetation and other parameters uh, to understand you know, relationships of the hornbills with uh, the habitat. So the entire area was divided into grids and yeah, these you know, trails were made and they were like at least 500 meters apart. This is the scheme showing the transects. Uh, now, by the way, this is 
I didn't, I, I think I only walked one or two transits in the beginning with uh, Dollar and Sitaram and Karishma, but mostly all this work, field work this year was done by Dollar and Sitaram and Kejam and also Karishma uh, sometimes. So basically, uh, this is uh, what they did. And yeah, some parts of Baksa, the habitat is, uh, you know, is hilly. So they had to also cover some of the grids in the hilly areas because earlier, the 2018 density estimates were only from the lowland area. Uh, so that's why we didn't have Rufus Necton bill at all in those uh, not detected. So I won't go into the methods. Many of you might be familiar with methods for transects, but basically, you know, you record the hornbill species, the flock size, time of sighting, the activity, and the perpendicular distance, and the GPS. Because we were walking these transects for hornbills, we also, um, you know, we also told them to, uh, you know, uh, record all the other mammal sightings they had of primates, squirrels, and other uh, groups. Uh, barking deer and all that, and uh, you know herbivores, um, and also they recorded the pheasants. Uh, we also recorded within a belt transect along this entire trail, on uh, ten meters on either side. We recorded the ripe fruiting plants of hornbill fruit plant species, which we already know, and also uh, evidence of disturbance like cut logs um, along within the ten uh, meter, uh, twenty meters. 10 meters on either side. Yeah, so uh, dollar and all, uh, they did this uh, from September to March. They had to stop uh, in March anyway because the breeding season was starting and then the lockdown started. Um, so they have uh, quite a bit of reasonable effort, but maybe more is required. Uh, 106 kilometers could have been more. Uh, but I think there was a lot of foggy days and there was a lot of some days were lost because of various reasons. But uh, this just shows, this table just shows the number of detections. And if you will notice that, you know, this year, the number of detections are very high of oriental pied hornbill, but uh, much lower for great hornbill. And uh, very minimal for wreathed hornbill. And only one rufous necked hornbill was sighted, even though they did the high elevation transects. These are the encounter rates. Um, I don't know why I put this table because I don't think it's gonna make much sense. Uh, but yeah, it's basically, we've not yet calculated the densities from this data. Um, uh, it's just uh, being done. Uh, so, but uh, you know, the encounter rate was only relatively high for the oriental pied hornbill. And this graphically shows you the encounter rates uh, for the species. And as you can see, the great hornbill is much lower. This is encounter rate and not densities, which uh, I showed you earlier from the previous year's work. Uh, interesting thing was that the hornbill encounter rate was positively correlated with the fruit tree density, which we had measured. And by the way, this part is preliminary uh, analysis. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, still in progress, most of this analysis. So oriental pied hornbill is also uh, correlated with fruit tree density. But hornbill encounter, this was not correlated with the disturbance in, uh, you know, uh, the cut log densities. Just also to show you that the encounter rates seem to differ based on the months. So, you know, December, January, there were much more sightings of um, hornbills uh, along the transects. I just wanted to flag that over here, we don't have an idea. We've not yet started that. Uh, we don't have an idea of the... Um, fruit availability patterns in Baksa because we've not done phenology monitoring. So in Pake, we have an understanding of when fruits are high, when, uh, you know, fruits are low, uh, when is the fruiting season, uh, you know, so uh, that can be then related to the um, uh, abundance of uh, hornbills. So I'm just, I just, since I've, we've not yet calculated the density estimates from this year's data, just plotted the encounter rates from the past year, uh, 2018 and now. And you can see that uh, there is a difference. And I don't know whether this is a real difference. Is it because the birds move season uh, annually or seasonally or something's happened? But uh, I don't want to speculate on it because we don't really know whether it's also related to some difference in the method or difference in observers, you know. So uh, that will be clear later when we complete all the analysis. 
Uh, we also did some vegetation sampling along these transects to understand, uh, you know, look, look at these uh, parameters in relation to hornbills. And I just wanted to describe the vegetation structure a bit. Uh, most of the uh, forest, you know, is secondary forest. Uh, much uh, many parts of Pakistan. We recorded 120. <laughs> We recorded 127 tree species, and so hello, is everyone there or is it hello? Yes, we are all there. No problem. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I hope you're not getting bored. Okay, so then uh, the, these are um, you know some of the important, the top eight or nine tree species that uh, came out in the PCQ. Tree density along these 71 trails varied a lot from three trees per hectare to 425 trees per hectare. And that, that is because we were sampling in all grids, you know, uh, this team, because, you know, some trails like were in really open habitat or very degraded habitat or next, you know, near the rivers and all that. So the average density was 101 trees per hectare. Okay, I'm switching tracks because I wanted to, so that was more, more about the abundance and uh, densities of hornbills in Baksa. So I just wanted to tell you about roosting because this is something we discovered in Baksa, which was very exciting also. But I just wanted to start with the roosting that we know in Arunachal. So there is this roosting site next to our base camp in Arunachal in the middle of the village where they started roosting from 2015 onwards. And our team monitors them throughout the year. And you can see that the numbers of hornbills uh, in 2019 were really high. Um, and almost throughout the year, they use the site, but there are differences uh, in the months and seasonally and between years. So, um, you know, 100 plus uh, reached hornbills coming and roosting here, right? So we are used to seeing that in Arunachal. And these are some of the roost sites uh, which are located close to the large river. This is on the edge of Paki Tiger Reserve, on the side of the reserve forest, where you can see the Albizia tree is full of uh, uh, reef thornbills. And this I had discovered when I first started my PhD work in 95, uh, 96, 97, that they use these communally, you know, roosting sites. And in those years, even great hornbills used to join these roost sites up to 60, 80 great hornbills along with 200 weak hornbills. So that used to be amazing. But over the years, great hornbills have stopped using these um, roost sites. Um, so there's another roost site where we have the Dibru River roost site where again numbers were very high in 2019, uh, 100 plus. Yeah, so this is quite, you know, spectacular. Although these numbers are nothing compared to what you get in Thailand. Uh, 700 wreath thornbills in some sites. And uh, for the plain pouch thornbill, there are some sites where you get 2,000 thornbills roosting together. But uh, what was exciting was that thanks to Tomogno and, uh, you know, even Titaram or others, uh, especially Tomogno, uh, Tomogno Sen Gupta, who is also with Nature Mates, he works mainly on butterflies. He told me about all these, some of these roosting sites that he had noticed, noticed you know. And then uh, our Sitaram and Orko started monitoring some of the ones that they knew of or had heard of. And so we've got some data on the roosting by reef hornbills and great hornbills in and around Baksa. So in the first year, they had identified four roosting sites. Um, you know, it's, it's not possible to monitor these every day, you know, because you have to go far to get permission also to go sometimes to some of these sites, you have to drive there and you have to go there at the end of the day when you've done all your work and you have to go in the evening just before they, you know. Uh, so, but uh, interestingly enough, you can see that in the first year they found in that 22 mile roosting site, uh, up to the maximum bird seen was 94 leaf hornbills. So, and great hornbill in a couple of sites, 18 and 15 great hornbills. And this is just interesting because it shows you the, they were monitoring from January to March. And you can see that as the breeding season approaches, 
the the numbers at the Rus side declined, and that's because partly because you know they dispersed to finding their nest sites, and half the population, you know, uh, I mean, if they breed adults, the pairs, uh, one half of the pair will be in the nest. But of course, we don't have data monitoring them during the breeding season to see how, whether these roost sites are used in the breeding season, but I believe they are not from uh, what these guys uh, say. This year, amazingly, uh, Dollar, Karishma, and Sita Ram were also again monitoring the 22 mile roost site and they found that they were roosting a little further ahead. And the numbers were 224 birds on one evening. So that is amazing. And, you know, so that is very interesting also because it contradicts. So when you see the density estimates for Reith Thornbill inside Baksa, it's like low, right? Uh, and you don't see them that much. And we've only found two nests. But there are lots of birds in the roost sites. So I believe that the population of Reith Thornbills is either moving quite a bit in the landscape or much of the population is also in the outside areas. And that'll be really interesting to investigate in future. And this year, of course, they found a few more roosting sites. So there are seven uh, roosting sites that are known. Um, this is like based on a lot of local information also. And some of them were not, one of them was not used when they went, but local people said that uh, they come and use there. This is the video shared by Karishma of the birds at this, you know, the 224 plus whatever. Yeah. And I'm sure some of you who are listening who are from North Bengal, maybe you, you're aware of this and you've seen it, but you know, it is, it's, it's very interesting and exciting. That bills are there so many such large numbers now to switch tracks a bit um, uh, the um, you know hornbills are under a lot of threat right so this photograph is from Arunachal where it's uh, they are hunted much more um, and you know logging is a big issue in many areas hornbill habitats have been converted due to uh, cash crop plantations like rubber and tea and other things right so one of the, uh, you know, why conserve hornbills, you know, and well, hornbills are very important seed dispersers and they have many ecological roles. And of course, they have intrinsic value as, you know, species and existence value. But uh, why we need to conserve hornbills is also partly like, you know, if you look at the distribution and the, uh, the you know, where hornbills are and what is their status, this is a, based on a survey that we, Rohit and I and others had done in 2013-14 across uh, five states of Northeast India, that is Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, uh, Mizoram, and Nagaland. And, you know, this basically is, it was an occupancy-based survey where we based, uh, is done interviews with uh, villagers, hunters, officials, forest staff, uh, uh, basically to try to ask them about the presence of hornbills in a given grid, um, you know, in uh, uh, in 1993 and 2013, so 20 years. Like we wanted to see what, what was the change, and basically this uh, color that you see, the occupancy, whatever you're seeing, is just the um, the green uh, shades shows the probability of uh, habit, you know, habitat de detection probability uh, for these species in this um, in the range. And as you can see that the great hornbill is actually only in a few uh, pockets, it's high, and that basically corresponds to some of the protected areas. In the rest of the landscape, it's pretty like bad, huh? And the, uh, the estimated like habitat which it occupies is 7,154 square kilometers based on our work. And uh, the other thing, a map shows the range of the Great Hornbill uh, from the IUCN in terms of the global, uh, you know, that um, Southeast Asia and uh, this um, Northeast India side. Of course, the Great Hornbill also occurs in Western Ghats, but anyway. 
So, and for the Rufus Neck Thornbill, it was even worse. 1,274 square kilometers. And if you see, Rufus Neck Thornbill, of course, doesn't occur in most of Assam. And it occurs only in a very few areas of eastern Nagaland, which are also like uh, heavily hunted. Then Mizoram, you know, so very low probability of habitat use throughout most of the area. And when we look at the reduction in habitat use probability over the 20 years, based on the data that we the interview data, you can see that, you know, um, there's been a lot of reduction, especially for the great hornbill and the rufous necked hornbill and the brown hornbill. Yeah. So hornbills are really uh, in a bad shape all over. So in that sense, the importance of, so we, you know, our work had always focused on Northeast India, right? But when we came to North Bengal, we realized that, you know, the rufous necked hornbill, uh, North Bengal is really a stronghold for the rufous necked hornbill, even though the area is maybe not that large, you know. And so apart from Baksa, we wanted to also uh, survey the areas outside um, Baksa, I mean, apart from Baksa, Mahananda and Nyora Valley and uh, some of the, uh, you know, other reserve forests and all that. So, um, I'm not giving the methods, but basically our surveys, we also uh, looked at tree density and uh, this just shows the tree density in the protected, in the few protected areas in comparison to um, other PAs in Arunachal. Um, this is basal area of trees. And then um, this survey was done last year uh, by Rohit and uh, other people, along with Sitaram and Orko and others. Um, this was uh, in Nyora Valley and Mahananda Wildlife Sanctuary, where you have three, three of the species. Reed Thornbill may occur, but it's not been uh, properly, I think, uh, recorded or reported, at least by us. They walked, uh, you know, it was a rapid survey. Uh, done over a period of one or two months, I think, and uh, I mean, a few weeks. So um, here the total effort was 60 kilo kilometers and it was done in an expedition mode. Many of you may be familiar with the names here. And they had some detections of rufous neck hornbills. This data has also not been fully analyzed yet. Uh, Mahananda Wildlife Sanctuary, actually we need to go back and do more work here. Uh, it was, um, it was, I mean, it was not completed fully, uh, the survey here. It was supposed to have been done later in, and it, it didn't. Um, so apart from all this uh, ecological work, we also uh, have had uh, some, you know, meetings and discussions with the local nature and tour guides, because our long-term uh, idea was that we need to uh, we may find lots of nests of hornbills and all, but if we want to develop a conservation and a monitoring program where hornbills are safeguarded, hornbill populations, then we'll need to engage with uh, different groups, right? And of course, and of course the forest department because it's the, it's within the tiger reserve in, in this case. So, um, but the nature guides in Baksa are also um, very much interested and uh, they needed training. So one of the things that we had done was a very, very, uh, it was a very short, because there were some, they had a lot of work and puja and all was coming. So they only found two days for us to have this thing. There was a plan for doing a much more uh, detailed uh, training workshop, which has not happened yet. We, at that workshop, we gave them some resource material, uh, field guides basically and all that. Um, and in September, 2019, we had a workshop with the Forest Department officials, uh, Mr. Ujjal Ghosh was there. Unfortunately, some of, many of the other officers could not be there because of another meeting or something. But there we all presented our work. So Rohit presented, I presented, and Karishma presented, as well as uh, we also had some of the community youth from Lak Panchar. They also presented about their area and what they were doing. So we have also uh, provided some guidelines for the homestays and nature guides and tourists has been shared with the forest department and the Lak Panchar youth. We are also hoping that the, you know, the nest that we have found in Baksa and other like areas will be, uh, you know, can be protected 
more, uh, how will I say it, um, in a more intensive way and monitored so that all these, uh, some of these small poaching incidences that might be happening on and off can be uh, stopped. Um, and uh, with regard to that, uh, you know, we have given some a document to the forest department, hope it, I mean, recently, um, suggesting how, uh, you know, some, uh, some guidelines and what could be done. Um, we've also had some interactions with some of the Lakpanchar youth who are very interested in hornbills and uh, conservation. There are many of them very good uh, bird guides. Uh, unfortunately, one of them who was very, very interested and who came to the workshop, he passed away in December on Mool Rai. And, you know, he was interested in also setting up a nursery, um, you know, and he had already started growing some saplings of some of these hornbill food plant species. And they wanted to, you know, develop, the, there was a lot of tourism there, but they want to make sure that they do things which are uh, within the, you know, with some limits and which doesn't disturb. Uh, the birds and also they didn't want they had they themselves have found five one bill nests in their area they wanted to also make sure that you know uh, many of them were interested in observing the nest and I think they've collected some information earlier so um, our team a couple of articles have been written about the, that area and the work and uh, we've also put together some of their obs observations and Karishma has written an article in their name, uh, which might be published uh, soon. So these are the, you know, workshop pictures and all that. And uh, so, um, huh, as a result of that workshop, Mr. Ujjal Ghosh had suggested that we um, make uh, some material for the forest department staff and also give some training to the department staff. This was supposed to happen in March, April this year but couldn't happen because of the lockdown and coronavirus, uh, unfortunately. So I don't know when we'll be able to do it. Um, he also suggested that we uh, make these brochures, you know, which, and there were quite a bit, many of the staff were very interested. In fact, some of them have called me later because we gave them some of my old Hornbill books to tell, uh, tell me about observations they are making. Uh, one of the rangers from one of the RF divisions and we've made these posters in uh, even in bengali or uh, nature mates they translated the posters into bengali and they printed the posters and it's been distributed in baksa i don't know whether it's been distributed yet in uh, the other places uh, so these were posters breeding cycle posters for the four hornbill species there as well as a overall poster and we made a booklet which basically tells the department staff about each of the species, um, a lot of information about their diet and ecology and nesting and all that. So this is one of the one poster um, and it's available huh, free for anybody who wants to use it anywhere. Um, it's downloadable on the NCF website. Um, then these are the breeding cycle posters for the four species. And this is the cover page, I mean, the page, I mean, showing the bo booklet that we've made. Um, this one has not been printed yet uh, because it got completed later in. Uh... So uh, some reflections. Uh, so the density of Great Hornbill was comparatively greater in 2018. However, a more extensive survey across the park revealed lower densities. We don't have the density numbers, by the way. I'm saying this based on encounter rates. Um, Reef Thornbill density appears very low uh, when you look at, uh, you know, walking in transects uh, in the park. But you, when you see the numbers in the loose sites, it's quite high seasonally. G uh, the Great Hornbill surprisingly is less susceptible to, oh, I made a mistake in the, uh, less susceptible to poaching here. Whereas uh, more incidences appear to be happening for Oriental Pied and maybe for Rufus Necton. So, and in Baksa, of course, the Rufus Necton bills are seen in higher elevations only. And, uh, but in Baksa, strangely enough, you see them at much lower elevations than in other places. <laughs> and the nest was, the, one of the nests is at a very low elevation. 
Um, so our future plans here are to, uh, you know, strengthen the conservation network with the department and the communities. And we hope to com complete some of the uh, surveys required in the higher elevations. Um, we want to increase the outreach and uh, support for hornbill conservation activities through the workshops with the department and also with some of the community youth. But um, the other idea that we've been thinking about is restoration because a lot of the areas are, uh, if the department, we discussed it with uh, Mr. Ujjal Ghosh when he was at the workshop because the department has nurseries uh, also. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, in Pake, we have a rainforest nursery, a restoration program for the last five years. So we have the knowledge and expertise to grow the native forest species and to, uh, you know, uh, do restoration. So ho we hopefully can do something like that in the degraded forest patches um, around Baksa. Yeah, and we would also like to work in some of the other areas um, because when we did that workshop we had uh, officials and staff from Borumara and all the other PAs as well as the reserve for territorial divisions and many of them seem very interested um, in knowing about hornbills in their areas. Oops. Yeah. Just wanted to thank uh, and acknowledge uh, uh, forest department. I mean, NCF does not have the permit, uh, permits directly. It is through Nature Mates and uh, thanks a lot to Nature Mates, who is our partner, and Arjun and Dev Sena and Tom Agno and Rishin and everybody. And uh, um, yeah, and everybody else. And, you know, thanks to my funding uh, agency, which uh, made, uh, you know, made this work possible. So because uh, Shujan had told me to talk, I mean, this has already been so long. I'm sure many of you are quite bored and sleepy. Uh, so I will not be talking about other aspects of our work in Arunachal. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aparita. There are a few questions uh, I would like to read out uh, for you. Uh, one okay. comes from Sagor uh, Adurjia. He's from Durgapur. He says, what is the reason behind the behind the southward facing orientation of the hornbill nest holes oh i don't know really i mean i have not looked at into that into detail because you know in earlier work we've never found any um, any significance in the nest cavity orientation so i was surprised to i mean it's only 50 percent of the nest which had this south facing thing uh, so i was surprised to actually see that in the, with the Baksa data. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question right now because in Pake or other areas, when we've looked at so many nests, we have seven, I mean, we've not found any pattern with uh, nest orientation. Yeah. Okay, next question yeah. is from Sarala Khaling. Yeah. Uh, Sarala is, uh, you know Sarala from before. Yeah, yeah, of oh, course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Many years. Uh, hi, Sarala. <laughs> so I can unmute herself if you want to speak. Hi. Uh, you can, uh, you can you ask your own question now. <laughs> Where are you now? Are I'm you in Gangtok? Oh, okay. Okay. Nice to. Uh, thanks for listening. Sarala, you can ask your own question. No, um, Apu, what I was wanted to know was, you know, we did this, we also had this project on, uh, um, in Neura Valley. Yeah. Looking at the dietary aspects, usually looking okay. at the dietary aspects of uh, the hornbill. Oh, so basically looking at you know uh, dietary use of wild edible fruits, huh. but also you know uh, looking at the competition between local communities and the hornbills actually. Oh, I so, see. Interesting. So what, yeah. So what they eat? A lot of it is collected and sold in the markets also. So we did a lot of surveys of these local markets and the villages actually around yeah yeah Nora valley yeah and we found a list of uh, these things so i just wanted to know your opinion you know because yeah. um, we didn't do on the ecological part so right. much so i wanted to know what is the impact of this on the hornbills because it seems like a lot of these are also uh, People make livelihoods out of these. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Sarala, I'd be very interested to know the uh, species names. Which other species? Okay, I'll just uh, 
Okay. Uh, pot in front of me. So I think um, one is par par ficus bengalensis. Nada scandens. Okay. Okay. I think the the sound is the sound the sound is bad suddenly. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can uh, talk about it. Uh, you know, talk about yeah, it. the species later. But I'll tell you the answer to this. Yes. You know, so in Arunachal, it's very interesting what you said because actually in Arunachal, I don't know if it's true in Neora Valley also. In Arunachal, there is a particular Phoebe species, mm -hmm. which which the Nishi people and other communities love. Mm. They go crazy for it, you know, and it doesn't fruit every year. And it's sold in the markets, you know, people collect it by kg, you know, and then they uh, sell it for uh, 5 rupees, you know, I mean, 10 rupees or 20 rupees for 5 fruits. And these are small, like, you know, 4 centimeter fruits. And hornbills also disperse this, you know. So ultimately, people are collecting all these hornbill fruits. Yeah. But uh, they, they will, they, I think, will realize that hornbills disperse them. <laughs> Unless, of course, some of the ficus could be dispersed by a whole range of seed dispersers. But, uh, you know, in the case of some of these larger uh, Laureaceae species, uh, fruits, uh, hornbills disperse them. So it will be very interesting to look at the impact of this collection regeneration. You know, a study uh, to look at the impact of this uh, on the regeneration of these uh, species in the wild. Because if most of the seeds are being removed, then uh, recruitment will be very low in the future. Yeah. I don't know, but you know, if it's ficus, it may not be so. Uh, I couldn't hear the names of all the species. I could hear uh, ficus, etada. So there's, a, I mean, a whole, okay. there's some Nepali names also. Oh, okay, okay. You yeah, like, you, you send it to me, no? Please. Yeah. <laughs> then we'll, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And next in line is Shubhendu Das. Shubhendu, you can <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. I hope Shubhendu is here. Well, if he's not here, what is the home range of all the sympatric hornbills? Uh, mm. And how many preferred nest trees present in all these ranges, especially in the species overlap zone? And any relationship between the body size ratio to the nest cavity size? Any difference between Baksa, Pakki, or Namdafa? Um, oh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> no, so I uh, so home range uh, we've only estimated for the Great and the Reed Thornbill in Pakki, you know. So and that is also a very short period of time, uh, three months, uh, you know. So home range of the Great Thornbill during the breeding season, I think I mentioned in the beginning, is one to two square kilometers in Pake. And in the non-breeding season, a couple of individuals that we have, the range is 50 to 60 square kilometers. But from Thailand, uh, studies show that they can range even much more, you know, in the... And uh, Reith Thornbill, the breeding season home range is, was uh, 50 square kilometers. But this is for one male. Um, we do not have... Uh, Reith Thornbill non-breeding season home range uh, because you know our data was only four. As far as uh, overlap uh, between, so if you saw the range, we've not yet analyzed in great detail the species differences in Baksa, but if you see elevationally, there seems to be a difference. So most of the great and the, the great and the oriental pied hornbill nests are in the lowland area. Um, well, whereas the rufous necked is obviously in the higher elevation, there was only one nest which was in the lowland area, which I repeatedly mentioned. Um, the uh, reef thornbill in Pake and Namdafa, it's a lowland, like it, it nests in lowland forest below 500 meters. Here, uh, it seems to be uh, in small numbers, you know, and we've only found two nests of reef thornbill in Baksa. But that's the paradox, no? Like, so while you don't see them much on the transects, you don't see them, don't see many nesting trees, but you see a lot of them roosting in large numbers outside or on the edge of the... So I don't know where they go and where their areas are. 
So the reed thornbill is actually a very interesting species and it requires satellite telemetry to study its movements and understand where it goes and what it does. Um, sorry, what was your other question? Uh, it was any relationship much... between the body size ratio to the nest cavity size? That's very interesting question. You, I can send you my paper based on my PhD Pake work. Okay. Um, you can have it for the whole long term period. <laughs> No, but basically I'll tell you that actually, you know, in Pake, for instance, um, I looked at the separation of the like, uh, three sympatric species. They were all using 90% of the nest trees were on tetramelis, right? So you would assume there's a lot of competition uh, between them for, uh, but, uh, you know, some of the axis by which they separate is based on the size of the cavity, right? So the size of... Um, Oriental pied hornbill cavities are usually like five to six centimeters, uh, while uh, reed hornbill is like eight to ten. Great hornbill is little uh, wider and longer, elongated. They also differentiate, I said, based a bit on the shape of the cavity. I mean, there seems to be a great hornbill seems to like elong, like you know, cavities which are elongated. Also, um, oriental pied hornbill nests are often on the main trunk or on these, um, you know, branches, uh, primary, uh, secondary branches, because it's a smaller size species that can nest in cavities on those kind of branches also. Um, and uh, yeah, but interestingly enough, although they separate based, the data shows that they can separate based on body size. There is a huge amount of competition, interspecific competition between hornbills, which suggests that you know it's not really uh, relevant because uh, great hornbills take over reef hornbill nests, and reef hornbills take over oriental pied hornbill nests. In the reserve forest in Arunachal, we have one nest which was an oriental pied hornbill nest, then it was a reef hornbill nest, then it was taken over by a great hornbill. So, and all of this is possible because we have long-term data, right? So in Pake, for instance, we know some nests for 24 years. So we know that, okay, who was the, you know, who nested in these years and who's the other one who took it over. Um, but it's interesting that we can, while we can say um, interspecies competition, I cannot say whether the same individual uh, species is nesting. You understand, like within the species, I can't say whether the nests are being taken over in different years by different pairs, because I can't differentiate between individual pairs, right? So, sorry for that long answer. No, no, it's <laughs> perfect. Uh, there's one from Aurijit, the Aurijit Banerjee, he's from Rajasthan. He's uh, okay. And, uh, he, the restoration of degraded forest won't yeah. won't that require planting or sowing of significant number of plants, maybe yeah. fifty to two hundred per hectare, or maybe more. Such an investment is significant and should come from the government. Uh, uh, that's what he's suggesting. He's from the government actually. Okay. So, so and, it'll be good. So it'll be great if the government yeah can because. Right now in Pake, what I do is with some funding from an organization that I have. So we are able to raise only about uh, four to 5,000 saplings per year. And we plant only about three hectares to four hectares per year. Some years it's been even less. Uh, but ours is a very, in, I mean, like we grow 60, 70 ecologically important species. So it's a very intense effort. Yeah, but we, we are, you're, I agree with you that it should be, uh, it'd be great if government funds it and there's more resources to do it, you know, in a large scale and, you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's one more question. Do they adopt artificial nests? Uh, do oh. hornbills adopt artificial nests? Yeah, so they, uh, in, um, in other countries, in Southeast Asia and in Africa, South Africa especially, there's been a lot of uh, nest box projects, right? Um, so uh, many, most on, uh, you know, in, in South Africa and all ground hornbills routinely, uh, southern ground hornbills and several of the other smaller species. In Asia, uh, it has been tried for oriental pied, for rhinoceros, for great hornbill, for bushy crested, 
and it has worked in Thailand, Singapore, and a couple of other places, uh, Malaysia. In India, we, um, there have been few efforts. Uh, there have been people who've done it for Indian Grey Hornbill in a few areas, and they have accepted, I believe, in, I have not seen those myself. We have tried in Pake last year, we've installed, uh, we designed, we got six nest boxes designed actually by Oyon Banerjee. I don't know if he's uh, here at the talk <laughs> here today, but uh, he uh, helped us design those boxes and we um, had, have installed four of them. But till now, we haven't seen any activity, uh, not uh, in Pake. So it was just more an experimental thing to try and see if it works. In South India, um, Kanan, Raghupati Kanan, along with an American uh, professor, they had tried it in, uh, in the Valparai area or in the Varachal area. But uh, it, was not a, it was not a success, that one. Because you, know, uh, you have to be very careful about the material and the design and the dimensions and all that. There's one from Mr. Naulak. I think he's from Manipur because he has. He said there's no data on hornbills from Manipur. Huh. And uh, so, are you planning to expand your studies into? <laughs> yeah, we would have. I don't know why we left out Manipur that time. You know, when we did those five states, it was very difficult. Actually, I mean, we we're trying to do so many states in those months, and then we didn't. Uh, also, getting permissions from all the departments and all. Yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, definitely, there should be some uh, survey in Manipur to determine uh, which are the good areas for hornbills in Manipur. Um, okay. There's one more about any observation about uh, pair fidelity. Oh, <laughs> so it's an interesting question. So all of you, many of you think that hornbills are strictly monogamous, right? Uh, you are asking about this, right? Monogamy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so, you know, if, uh, I mean, I believe that evolutionarily it, it seems impossible if that hornbills can cheat because, you know, for the male, because firstly, the female goes inside the cavity, right? If she is mated and she's going to have a chick and, it, and if the male is feeding a female, she's sealed inside, right? So he, if he's got to feed another female, that's impossible, right? So, but interestingly enough, in the field, We've seen some strange uh, behaviors. These are just anecdotal observations, four or five observations, where we've seen the male with another female uh, while he has a nesting female inside the nest. So we don't know what those mean. And uh, yeah, but uh, uh, there has been one study, and I can't remember the results properly right now, in uh, Africa where uh, with some of the smaller hornbill species in Kenya, where they've done genetic uh, testing and they have uh, confirmed that it was strict monogamy in those trees. So. There is a possibility then. <laughs> next, next, yeah. next question is, does hornbills have gland penis? And uh, how much time uh, takes for great and rufous next hornbill nestlings to take part in breeding oh you, i mean at what age do they start uh, breeding they i think they start breeding at three to four years in the the hornbills yeah the great and the percent and can make out right. no. at the end and at the end the jitiman wants to ask you some questions and he said uh, only at the end i will ask you so jitiman you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly Somewhere related to that uh, adaptation, because you are working in a changing landscape and working for long. So have, have you noticed any kind of adaptation like, for, for example, so they have uh, priority trees. So because of uh, decreasing number of those priorities, they change the trees and they are using some trees which they never use. Some kind of, I mean, those kind of adaptation. Have you noticed in any species or any, any So Yeah. This is the last so, question. Huh. Yeah. 
So can I answer that first, and then I'll go to the next yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it's an interesting question because so when I began my PhD work in '97 and till 2000 in Pakhe, I did not see any interspecific competition for net, uh, nest cavities. Of course, that was just a four-year period. But soon after, three years later, when I went back to Bakke again to start work in 2003, I started seeing this co competition for nest cavities. And I also observed the birds uh, nesting in trees, which they never used before. A uh, couple of species, I mean, we knew those trees. And in fact, we used to look at those trees as potential nest trees, but they had never used it earlier. But from 2003 onwards, they started using those uh, cavities, which were, I considered suboptimal. Why suboptimal? Because they were on the edge of the road, close to, you know, uh, disturbance and all that. So those were some of those observations earlier. And uh, one of the interesting adaptation that is happening now, which we are actually trying to analyze, I didn't, because Shujan asked me to talk about the North Bengal work, I didn't go into all that. But because we have long-term data in Pake, we are seeing a shift in the breeding timing in uh, Pake uh, because we have data from 20 years. We are starting to see that hornbills are nesting earlier in Pake than they used to in the past. And uh, in 2017, most of the nests were 29 days earlier than the normal average in the previous uh, 17, 18 years. So that was a big shift. And, and obviously because they nested earlier, they exited earlier. I did not see any correspond, like I did not see any problem because at the, I had expected that, oh, they're nesting so early. So then there'll be some problem. Maybe the chicks will not, you know, maybe it will not be successful, but everything was fine. And correspondingly, we have noticed that the fruiting patterns that I documented in the past has changed because we also have been uh, monitoring the fruiting trees long term. So we found that the fruiting tree, uh, you know, the timing of fruiting has also shifted. So in that sense, hornbills seem to be, it's great, hornbills seem to be adapting to the shift. I don't know whether it in the long term will have some other impact on them, but in but it's funny because in 2018, uh, it, they again went back to nesting in the normal period. But 2019, they again nested earlier than the normal. So, but in 2019, the five great hornbills for the first time in Pake, five great hornbill nests failed. And we don't know the reasons for that. So there's all kinds of like, you know, there's things happening, you know, because of, and I think it's related to climate change. Uh, although we are not able to directly relate it, but you know, it is, uh, we have the weather data also. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered okay. your question. No, 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 I just, I'm, you have a second I'm, question, I'm just trying to want. understand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a small, uh, another uh, small question. This is a, uh, based on observation. So when I was in, uh, in Narkundam, uh, working on Narkundam Hornbill, yeah. I looked on pattern ah. like uh, when they feed there is a cycle like uh, i mean my question is here that if you see the same kind of pattern in any species they i mean there it is not it was not haphazard like okay, there's uh, feeding the uh, fruits and fruits and fruits so there's a cycle like fruits fruits protein i mean the insects and then fruits i mean there's a pattern in insects and fruits hmm. there's a you know hmm. uh, i mean it not chaotic it was not chaotic mm. so i i observe, but my observation like for 15 days observation is it was not a long observation mm. so have you noticed some kind of this here also in uh, this this species like is there any pattern in the you know the sequence of uh, feeding the in uh, the insects and the fruits in the in the nest yeah in the nest yeah okay the, uh, yeah yeah so one of the patterns i'm talking broadly i'm not talking about daily individual patterns so you know the hornbill like when we do nest watches we'll be sitting from five in the morning or six in the morning you know before the like the first visit till the uh, sometimes i used to do like the entire day uh, 
so basically the horn yeah so the 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 male goes foraging it will bring fruits it will also bring uh, insects at some point so yeah. but i am talking so the broad pattern is that generally the um, after the chick hatches the proportion of animal or insect matter increases they bring more uh, insects and animal matter after the chick hatches and that is related to the chick's uh, development and growth and also by, obviously they also feed on fruits that are available at that time so it's very interesting when you uh, record the seeds falling in the below the hornbill nest in the midden and you collect those in seed traps you can see that it mimics the uh, the availability of fruiting so if you are monitoring the phenology of the trees in the forest the fruiting and you collect the hornbill uh, diet you will see that their diet keeps shifting based on what is available i am not sure if i answered your question but yeah i mean they they do uh, have a pattern but on a daily basis i don't know it's hard to make that out right but they will have a mix of things in their diet oh. uh, yeah so they'll have figs for calcium and all that for different uh, so uh, one last okay. question does the marking on yeah. the cast really tell us the age of the hornbill especially in Ruf uh, rufus neck uh, and breathed breathed also yeah so it it does to an extent so like i have seen a juvenile growing up in pake it was a baby without any markings and oh another interesting thing maybe you guys don't know that the reef thornbill juveniles all juveniles look like the male in the reef thornbill and uh, only if if they are female they only start changing coloration after one to two years okay so there was a captive reef thornbill in pakke which was called raja okay then after two years it became rani it's because it changed coloration but to get back to the question about the cast so basically if you note i mean i noticed that it grows it uh, it is almost exact like one one and a half years there is a cask forming like the reef thornbill has a reef right on so that is corresponding to a year even for the rufus snake similar but only thing is that you can't hornbills are very long lived in the wild they live up to 30 i mean in the in captivity you have 60 year old hornbill you have 35 to 40 year uh, hornbills right so we can only obviously the number of uh, uh, markings or the reeds will not uh, keep on increasing based on so i guess you can say the minimum age so i, I have seen up to 8 or 7 right uh, mark so you can say up to that age but beyond that if the bird is older you will not be able to tell but for below yeah that you can say that yeah it is thank you shujan the opposite the question could not opposite the our question is gone away again ha please everybody maybe you can uh, start up your videos and i'll hand over to dipankar uh, he wants to uh, he wants to say something so maybe everybody can open up the start up the videos you can see how many people are there and uh, bolo dipankar you're on thanks so thanks aparajita for a great talk uh, would like to talk about uh, my first interaction with aparajita uh, it was uh, in the office of the chief wildlife warden of arunachal pradesh most likely 96 or 97 oh my god and and i don't know what to say she was waiting for her permission i was also waiting for my permission we were not talking to each other we didn't know each other <laughs> and after a while there were, those are the days when we didn't have facebook we didn't have mobile phones and after a while i think one of the local officers came in uh, ringu or somebody who spoke to me in bengali and all this while we were like oh i am waiting oh yeah you are also waiting and uh, didn't know didn't even introduce each other and then ringu said that babu mushai how are you and then aprajit said babu mushai is another one this guy is a bengali i said oh acha okay so then that started our interaction and after that Uh, we kept bumping into each other in uh, not exactly in in field areas in namda five never worked but in different parts of uh, runachal so thanks a lot aparajita for this fascinating talk and uh, maybe in the future initiatives of bws uh, if there are some studies which are related to habitats and hornbills maybe we would 
require your advice and your guidance for that. Thanks a lot for yeah. that. Okay. Keep inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll close the meeting. Thank you, Aparita, for taking so much time and effort for us. Um, I mean, what can I say? Thank you so much. I hopefully yeah. we'll get you again for many other other mm -hmm. things. And uh, yes, and we we hope to do some more yeah. work in North Bengal areas because that's one of the best places in the country also for I mean yeah. general birds of all, yeah. all kind of birds. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well. Yeah. I think now. And Yes, please. Bolo. Yeah. And I just wanted to say that, you know, I presented the data, but by the way, all this work, I'm quite old now. All the field work and the hard work for most, I mean, I, I went there, of course, some visits, but, every, you know, Karishma, Dollar, and all these people have done the work, and Sita Ram and all of them. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, actually, I should have talked about the rest of my hornbill work, and I should have asked these guys to present about the. North well, we'll get them. We'll get them on again for some some yeah, other sure, program, sure. and 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 oh, they can okay. they can definitely yeah. enrich us of what's yeah. exactly going on, uh, because yeah, this yeah. is a never-ending work. This is not going to end. This is going to carry yes. on. Yes. And Baksa, yes. you have just started. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much, and I'll thank say good night on behalf of everyone. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you for coming. Thanks. Okay then. Yeah. Bye. All right. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Good night. I'll close the yeah. meeting.